that there was some sort of larger agenda guiding UFO encounters. There was a pattern to tease out. There was a subtle attempt to nudge the global society into some new form. And that form, Valet was surprised to discover, is religious. Welcome to Modern Dogma, a Christian considering today's ideas. In part one, we made a deductive case where, starting with the fact that the Bible gives a comprehensive account of creation, the only four categories of intelligent beings are God, men, angels, and demons. This means if there is a genuine subset of the UFO phenomenon that are not caused by men, it has to be demons. Now, starting with part two, it turns out if we do an inductive study of the UFO phenomenon, where we start with the individual UFO sightings themselves, the descriptions match. They act and look just like the Bible's descriptions of demons. So what we've done is figuratively grab the same stick from both ends. Top down, starting with the Bible, down to the particular question of UFOs, it's demons. Bottoms up, starting with the particulars of the UFO phenomenon itself and then fitting it to scripture, it's still demons. So what are these non-man-made UFOs like? Number one, they are non-physical. To be specific, they are spiritual. Number two, they are notorious, persistent liars. And today we arrive at our third characteristic. The UFO phenomenon is surprisingly religious. Now, once again, like this entire series, there's a lot of assumptions we are making to even get to this point. This whole series is one long string of conditional probabilities. There's a probability that the really extraordinary subset of UFO sightings is just a minority subset because most of them can be explained by natural causes. But that extraordinary subset, we have to assign a probability that they are genuine. People might all be lying. That is actually within the realm of possibilities. So the worst we might be doing here is just wasting our time. None of this is real. Every inexplicable UFO sighting is just a hoax that is waiting to be debunked in the future. Unlikely, but possible. Then we have to assign a probability that among UFO eyewitness accounts where people are, people are claiming to interact with the intelligent non-human occupants of those UFOs, a probability needs to assign that those eyewitnesses aren't all lying. Then we have a probability that if at least some of those eyewitnesses are genuinely interacting with intelligent non-human beings, that those genuinely existing beings are in fact responsible for the UFOs. Maybe the beings are lying. So that's all to say, there's a possibility here that the UFO crafts are a separate phenomenon than these non-human intelligent beings that make contact with people. So again, we might all just be wasting our time assuming inexplicable UFOs are even real. And in this inductive study we're performing in parts two and three, there's an additional complication because I'm going to be basing my arguments here on something beyond just the UFO themselves. We're going to be working with eyewitness accounts of people that are coming into contact with the beings that claim to control the UFOs. However, this is the point I want to once again emphasize. I said it very quickly last episode, but let's say in 10 years, every single case study and piece of evidence I am working with gets debunked. Here's the larger point. The UFO phenomenon in that scenario, whether genuine or just a hoax, is still a product of demonic force and ideology. Whether these are genuine spiritual beings, that is still my strong conviction, or just, just a bunch of lying humans pulling a prank on the world, the UFO phenomenon still pulls people further away from the Lord Jesus Christ and pulls people further away from the truth and pushes people into destructive lies. No matter which way you slice and dice UFOs, whether they're real or just one elaborate hoax, this is the product of demonic, wicked thinking, not a product of God. So we are admittedly working with a chain of assumptions here. I continue to think the probabilities are high that supernatural crafts are genuinely present and zipping around in our atmosphere. And I still think the probabilities are high these supernatural crafts and beings claiming to be extraterrestrials or 
interdimensional beings or whatever other nonsense are all part of the same phenomenon. And I think due to these high probabilities, this is still a topic worthy of thinking through and addressing as a Christian armed with the word of God. I think too many Christians right now are just tuning out the probability that this UFO phenomenon is genuine and may actually grow in prop popularity and mainstream consciousness. And my concern is many of us won't be ready to face that scenario with a robust scriptural answer. My concern is too many Christians right now are just waving away UFOs like it's something funny to laugh at or just saying, ah, bah, whatever, that's not important. There are bigger things to worry about. I was probably in your camp five years ago. But again, everything changed for me in 2020 when the Department of Defense a national government that God granted his derivative authority stepped into the ring and declassified the Nimitz UFO videos. That was the turning point for me. So I exhort my spiritual family. It's time to be prepared. We need a systematized, Bible-based answer. And that's what I'm hoping these series of videos will provide. So let's continue with characteristic three. Assuming supernatural UFOs are real, and assuming the beings responsible for UFOs are actually communicating with people, when we inspect the best available accounts of people coming into contact with non-human intelligent beings, so these are people going through polygraph tests, people that never change the details of their stories through decades of time, what we discover is a pattern that reveals UFO beings are bizarrely very theological creatures. They are not irreligious. Far from it. They are extremely religious, often speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ by name. They make very significant theological propositional statements. And uniformly, these accounts of religious non-human intelligent beings speaking with humans deny the teachings of the Bible. In 1967, for instance, we have an account of Betty and Dreesen who claim to have been abducted by humanoid otherworldly creatures and then brought to another world where she saw God. Now, off the bat, we already know that detailed accounts of people claiming to go to heaven and speak with God are false for two biblical reasons. Number one, we have a divinely inspired account of a genuine prophet that actually was transported to heaven namely the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, and he states that he, quote, heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter, end quote. Man may not utter. People are not allowed to give accounts of what is in heaven in God's abode while living on this earth. It's forbidden. But second, we know Accounts of speaking with God are false because the Bible gives clear instruction that direct revelation from the Lord has ceased in this age. Jude chapter 1 verse 3, for instance, states that biblical revelation is, quote, once for all delivered, end quote. It's finished, in other words. Similarly, in Revelation chapter 22, we've talked about this passage before, in verse 18 to 19, the Holy Spirit gives strict instruction that we cannot add to Scripture. Everything God wants to say to us in this world has been said. The Bible as it stands today in these 66 books is sufficient for every major question in life. However, Betty Andreessen's account of meeting God mediated through these otherworldly creatures becomes even more problematic when she shares what the message of these creatures is. Allegedly, the spiritual creatures believe the problem with humanity is that they are self-destructive. So far, so good. No disagreements there. But the solution to man's imminent destruction is to study nature. The glaring theological problem with this advice, though, is that nature contains no salvific information. What Romans chapter 1 verse 18 tells us is that all nature reveals is the wrath of God. Nature tells us God exists. There is obviously a creator of the universe and he is not pleased with the sins you knowingly commit. Your conscience bears witness of that, Romans 2. But that's it. There is no good news in nature itself. 
The entire foolish epistemological pursuit of man can be arguably summed up as men attempting to find salvation through the study of nature. Modern-day materialist, anti-supernaturalist atheists posit that all of reality is just atoms and molecules. Continuing in Romans chapter 1, God condemns these nature-gazers who, rather than hearing the message of nature that God exists and men must turn to the special revelation of Scripture to know how to be reconciled to Him, they worship creation itself. As it states in verse 25, men exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. End quote. Nature, what theologians call general revelation, is supposed to funnel you toward special revelation, the Bible. It's only in the Bible that men can find the solution for their self-destruction, not nature. And then there's a case of Whitley Strieber, whose story we discussed at length in part one. After claiming to have communicated with non-human intelligent beings, which he stated radically shook up his nominal Catholic upbringing, Strieber was inspired in 2021 to write an utterly heretical book entitled Jesus, A New Vision, wherein Strieber claims Jesus was not God, but simply a fully actualized human being, and that he did not resurrect in bodily form. Non-Christian, yet nevertheless renowned and probably the most well-informed ufologist Jacques Vallée, whom we introduced last episode, after several years of researching the UFO phenomenon, also recognized the heavily religious undertones of UFO encounters. In his book, Messengers of Deception, Vallée states, quote, Why is it, I wondered, that the occupants of UFOs behave so much like the denizens of fairy tales and the elves of ancient folklore? Why is the picture we can form of their world so much closer to the medieval concept of Magonia, the magical land above the clouds, than to a description of an extraterrestrial planetary, planetary environment? And why are UFOs becoming a new religious form?" End quote. Valet's central concern in this book who, by the way, is once again not a believer, but Valet recognized by God's common grace on his thinking in this area that there was some sort of larger agenda guiding UFO encounters. There was a pattern to tease out. There was a subtle attempt to nudge the global society into some new form. And that form, Valet was surprised to discover, is religious. In fact, Valet goes further. After happening upon the religious pattern of UFOs, Valet spent some time researching all the different occult groups in his local area. He even attended some of the meetings to get the inside scoop. And what did he discover about these occult religions? Quote, While doing research into the theories of occult groups in California, I did not find a single group that had a consistent belief system, but neither did I find one that did not claim to have had some form of contact with an alien form of intelligence, end quote. Fascinating stuff. And later in the book, this leads Valet to ponder the question, did every religious founder encounter the same category of beings? Islam, Mormonism, all the various occult religions, are they all based on contact with the same dark being? And of course, as Christians, our answer is a resounding Obviously, if the founders of Islam, Mormonism, and every other offshoot of the one true religion of Christianity are not lying in their statements that they encountered God, quote unquote, their encounter with this God has all the same qualities as UFO contact. This is all the same phenomenon. And it is a story that began in the Garden of Eden as he was falsely giving revelation to man. Satan always wants to counterfeit whatever God does. Satan wants to be God, ultimately. This is how Satan is condemned in Ezekiel chapter 28, where he is represented by the wicked prince of Tyre. God condemns the king of Tyre who represents the devil because in verse 2, quote, Your heart is proud, and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of the gods, in the heart of the seas, end quote. And one of the primary aspects of God Satan wants to imitate is the giving of supernatural revelatory theology. 
Satan loves to make religious statements. He loves to pretend to have profound insight into the spiritual realm, a world beyond this world that he can enlighten you with, an unseen, invisible power. He loves to opine about God, who God is, what he is like, who the creator of the universe is that no one else is telling you. Of course, he claims to be the creator, ultimately. But the important aspect of demons that you need to understand is that they are theists. They believe factually in the existence of a personal, revelation-giving, communicating God and the spiritual realm. Satan is not an enlightenment, anti-supernaturalist skeptic. He's not an atheist. In James 2.19, the Holy Spirit states, quote, You believe that God is one. You do well. Even demons believe and shudder, end quote. In the words of a famous preacher, I can't remember who I'm stealing this quote from, but you believe in God? Great. You have a theology that's as good as a demon. It's not enough to just believe in the factual existence of God. I remember I had a friend I was evangelizing to once, and he was telling me kind of meekly, well, you know, at least I believe in God. That counts for something, doesn't it? No. It doesn't. I'm sorry. We already know you believe in God. The problem is you suppress that knowledge of God and willfully choose to ignore his commands. That's Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. Look it up. Everyone believes in God. Demons believe in God, but they refuse to bow the knee. That is a difference between rebels and Christians. In the words of my late spiritual mentor and pastor, one of my spiritual fathers, truth be told, the gospel can be described as King Jesus coming to you with terms of surrender and demanding you sign it. He invites us to be his friend. The Heavenly Father invites us to be his child. But you need to first agree you are his conquered slave. In the words of Romans 9, verses 20 to 21, Clay Meet Potter. You need to fundamentally rethink your ontology. There are no rights here in Christianity. There's no autonomy. There's only grace. There's only mercy. Things you do not deserve. He is the king. You are the subject. He is the creator. You are creation. Psalm chapter 115, verse 3, quote, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases, end quote. The world cannot abide this concept, right? That is the dividing line between faith and rebellion. Everyone is cool with a Jesus that heals the blind, a Jesus that loves the poor and the sick, but a Jesus that is a conquering king that demands your fealty? To that, the late militant atheist Christopher Hitchens declares, this belief in a supreme and unalterable tyranny is the oldest enemy of our species, the oldest enemy of our intellectual freedom and our moral autonomy, and it must be met and must be challenged and must be overthrown, end quote. Words that can be practically plucked out of the devil himself. You see, at the end of the world, which is written for our benefit in detail in the book of Revelation, by the way, it's not really a mystery, just read the Bible and you know the future, imagine that. But in the final days of this present age, God allows Satan to temporarily achieve his great ambition, which is a unified global religion where he is worshiped as God, lowercase g. Revelation chapter 13, starting with verse five, quote, and the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven, end quote. And then jumping down to verse 8, quote, And all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain, end quote. Why are UFO contactees receiving religious information that contradict the Bible? Because UFO contactees are communing with demons, and demons are intensely religious beings that hate the true God of heaven. Characteristic four of UFOs 
is that they cause danger and even instances of death in their manifestations. UFOs, which once again, I remind us, stands for an unidentified flying object, are inherently dangerous phenomena to air traffic. Just to remind you all from part one, I am in fact a professional aviation safety systems engineer that works for the Federal Aviation Administration, also known as the FAA. The FAA are aviation regulators, which means we ensure and monitor the safety of air traffic. And it should be pretty obvious, even for non-aviation experts, but having a bunch of unidentified flying objects zipping around next to our helicopters and commercial airliners is extremely dangerous. In fact, the FAA considers unidentified aircraft so dangerous that in January 2020, they rolled out what's called the ADSB out mandate, which basically states that most aircraft operating in most of the airspace needs to be equipped with what's known as a transponder. That is, it's a device that tells people like air traffic controllers, hey, I'm over here, this is who I am, so make sure nobody's flying around me so that we don't collide. It is extremely important for flying objects to be identifiable. Especially with the explosive growth of air traffic over the years, the airspace is a precious limited resource that countries all over the world is constantly negotiating with different parties in order to share. In fact, UFOs pose such a significant danger to the United States airspace that Dr. Richard Haynes, former NASA research scientist, produced a 90-page technical report entitled Aviation Safety in America, a Previously Neglected Factor, which details 56 near misses with UFOs, quote, all affecting the safety of the aircraft, end quote. In this report, Dr. Haynes details cases of UFOs causing electromagnetic interference on aircraft navigation systems and other cases where pilots have to make a sudden dive to avoid a near collision. And this is, in fact, normal behavior for pilots encountering UFOs. There are countless records of UFOs which exhibit intelligence and extreme maneuverability purposefully getting as close as possible to aircraft, often tailing them as the pilots try to swerve out of the way and then causing pilots to make unsafe maneuvers while in a panic. In fact, there are even cases of UFO sightings that probably led to the death of the pilot. Journalist Leslie Keane documents that on October 21st, 1978, 20-year-old private pilot Frederick Valentich communicated to air traffic controllers that he was being harassed by a UFO until radio communication suddenly cuts off, in all likelihood due to Valentich crashing into the sea. When assessing different phenomena and teachings and religious groups and teachers, the Lord Jesus Christ provides us a very elegant litmus test in Luke chapter 6, verse 43, where he states, quote, for no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit, end quote. Phenomena that cause danger and hazards and even death is not a mark of God who is a God of life and safety and peace. A very interesting distinction between people, as recorded in scripture, encountering genuine holy angels versus a demon is the persistent level of fear a person encountering a demon feels. Whereas when a person encounters a holy angel, even though there is initial fear, specifically due to the supernatural nature of the encounter. So for example, the priest Zechariah in Luke chapter one was serving inside the holy section of the temple when he encounters a man off in the corner of his peripheral vision. Now, this was a very alarming event because nobody was supposed to be able to be inside the temple other than the ministering priest. The Mosaic law states that anyone that tries to enter the holy uh, section of the temple and they are not authorized, or even if they are, technically, they might hold the right office. If they're not properly ceremonially cleansed or if they're entering in some kind of flippant manner, they are instantly killed. And this is, of course, what happened to Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, who uh, scripture states was offering unauthorized fire. And there's some speculation based on the next passage that they may have been inebriated with alcohol. But in any case, Zechariah in Luke 1 was alarmed when he encountered this holy angel, Gabriel, who came to bring him a prophecy that his elderly wife, Elizabeth, was going to bear a son because encountering an angel, a supernatural being, is oftentimes a very alarming event. However, 
Whenever a human being encounters an angel, though he is initially terrified by the glorious sight, the angel will reassure the man, do not be afraid, and that reassurance is instantly effective. You see this in Luke 1 because after Zechariah is described as being very afraid and perturbed by witnessing this angel, and what I find to be one of the most amusing passages of Scripture in verse 18, Zechariah is apparently so relaxed and comfortable around Gabriel that he starts mouthing off to him. In Luke chapter 1, 18, Zechariah states, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. He was basically doubting the prophetic promise that his wife would be able to give birth to John the Baptist in her old age. And Zechariah was not asking this question in a neutral fashion, just asking for some clarification. That's a perfectly valid thing to do. That's, that's the same question that the more righteous Mary asked when she was given a similar promise, that even though she was a virgin, she would give birth to a son, Jesus Christ. Rather, Zechariah was asking out of a heart of doubt. And it was particularly unacceptable because he was a priest. He was one of the premier theologians of the day, as the class is supposed to be known for. So he doubted God's promise. But what I find so amusing about this passage is that even though Zechariah is in front of a mighty, holy angel that ministers before the creator of the universe in the heavenlies, this incredibly powerful, glorious being, this angel, being holy, not a demon, apparently made Zechariah so comfortable that he was able to possess enough of his mental faculties to the point of mouthing off to this angel in unbelief. But that is what holy beings are like. That is what God is like. Isn't that your experience? Doesn't God deal with us even in our moments of persistent sin when you're committing the exact same sin that you promised last week that you weren't going to commit again and you do it over and over again hasn't your experience been that god is so patient and gracious to you not dealing with you as quickly as he ought to now don't mishear me god will absolutely deal with persistent sin in your life i guarantee it ask me how i know that's why the book of Hebrews states that God disciplines those he loves just like an earthly father would. He's our heavenly father, and if we are truly his children, he's going to discipline us because he loves us, and he actually cares about our spiritual life. This is not the experience of non-believers, by the way. Non-believers have absolutely no relation to God. In a true sense, God has absolutely nothing invested in the non-believer's life, and they kind of just float through life committing whatever kind of sin they want, living whatever kind of life they want, and basically nothing happens to them. No interference from heaven. But even when God deals with his children's sins, has it not been your experience, as it has been in mine, that God is often so slow to deal with us and he makes us feel so comfortable around him that more often than not, we are taking advantage of his grace. Isn't that the sad truth? Holy angels reflect that kind of level of mercy and comfort and safety that God exhibits. But encounters with the demonic cannot be starkly more different. I think a great illustration of what it looks like for men to encounter demons is the story of the so-called prophet Muhammad when he first purportedly encountered the same angel, by the way, Angel Gabriel in Luke 1, and received the first revelations that would later become the Qur'an. As recorded in the Muslim Sahih al-Bukhari, Volume 1, Book 1, Hadith 3, according to Muhammad's wife Aisha, when Muhammad encountered this angelic messenger, the angel three times squeezed him so hard that he, quote, could not bear it anymore, end quote. Muhammad walked away from that encounter confused and disoriented and anxious about what entity he communicated with. And in fact, he was not convinced he encountered the true God until he had to be persuaded by his wife Khadija and her cousin Waraka bin Nafal. Now, when we read scripture, what we discover is there are several elements of Muhammad's encounter with this angelic being that persuades us Muhammad did not encounter a holy angel, but in fact, a demonic fallen angel. First of all, notice that Muhammad required persuasion by people that were not eyewitnesses, by the way, for him to walk away with the conviction that he in fact encountered Allah rather than a demon. 
any genuine encounter with either God in a theophany, as it's called, or holy angels never require convincing. That is an extremely important yet subtle and often missed point by people in the charismatic movement today. A genuine prophecy with God or one of God's messengers do not require supplementary evidence. The transmission of the communication itself is somehow miraculous such that the recipient of the revelation as well as external witnesses do not need any convincing. Now, the Bible does not record for us the mechanics of genuine supernatural prophecy that cause it to have this extraordinary quality. Why is it that every single time genuine heavenly prophecy is being uttered, the recipient is never ever recorded as questioning the source of the prophecy? Because that would be a natural thing to do, right? We don't know. And further, the fact that the details of those mechanics aren't preserved for us is very compelling evidence that tells us modern day prophets do not exist. Whether by man or by aliens, there are no more modern day prophets. The modern day gift, the sign gift of prophecy has ceased to function. This is the theological position known as cessationism. And it is actually very relevant to dealing with the UFO phenomenon biblically. And we're going to discuss it in more detail in a later part. But all that to say, Scripture depicts recipients of genuine prophetic revelation from genuine heavenly beings never need to be questioned. Or stated another way, genuine biblical revelation is inherently, by nature, irrefutable. Again, we don't know the details of what made the transmission of biblical prophecy irrefutable. What we do know is that the God of the Bible controls every aspect of reality. And if he decides to hard code into human reality, an instance, like in Luke 1 of the priest Zechariah receiving revelation from the angel Gabriel, if God wants to hard code into the entirety of human consciousness, align into the programming of reality that states every single human being in the world will acknowledge that Zechariah genuinely encountered an, an angelic being and was giving in Zechariah genuine prophetic revelation, we know God is able to do that. This is not at all what it looked like when Muhammad was encountering the exact same purported being, Gabriel. Additionally, notice that Muhammad was being assaulted by this being. Muhammad was being subjected to a dangerous situation. Muhammad was being squeezed so hard by this being, he was pushed to the point of breaking. Does that not sound similar to how UFOs purportedly like to fly, right up to the fuselage of aircraft, right to the point of breaking, harassing these pilots, causing pilots to need to make emergency maneuvers, panicking them into nearly crashing, and sometimes actually crashing. The subset of the UFO phenomena that is inherently inexplicable create danger and death, and these are not the qualities of God and holy angels. These are the characteristics of demons. Our fifth characteristic of UFOs is they exhibit an unnerving desire to inhabit the lives and the minds of people. Returning to the alien abduction case of Whitley Strieber, Strieber concludes regarding his experience in his book Communion, quote, People who face the visitors report fierce little figures with eyes that seem to stare into the deepest core of being. And those eyes are asking for something, perhaps even demanding it. Whatever it is, it is more than simple information. The goal does not seem to be the sort of clear and open exchange that we might expect. Whatever may be surfacing, it wants far more than that. It seems to me that it seeks the very depth of the soul. It seeks communion, end quote. Strieber unwittingly spoke better than he knew in describing one of the great ambitions of demons on earth, which is to possess people. The Bible is replete with divinely inspired cases of what are known as demon-possessed people. And to explain the mechanics of demon possession, the Lord Jesus Christ gives us an analogy in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 to 45, where in this passage, D Jesus describes men like a house. And like a house, human beings are made to be occupied by something. Nobody builds a house and keeps it empty. 
houses are supposed to be lived in by intelligent beings. And apparently, men are the same. Now, the way God made men from the beginning, as recorded in Genesis 1 and 2, they're supposed to be indwelt by God, the Holy Spirit. That was always the end goal of the Creator. We were not supposed to be empty, autonomous creatures living our best lives now for ourselves. Men were made for God, to be in communion with God, and to worship God. But after the fall, men in their natural state can now be likened to empty houses. We were made to be in perfect union with God. Now there is nothing inside of us. And you wonder, if you're an unbeliever watching this video, why your life always feels so empty and pointless. Part of the problem is you are literally empty inside. And in fact, being an empty house is actually an incredibly scary and dangerous state to be in. And this is because, starting with Matthew 12, 43, quote, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation." End quote. Persistently remaining an empty house, in other words, persisting in your sin and rebellion against God rather than repenting and placing your trust in Jesus and his work on the cross and resurrection, makes you potentially vulnerable to demonic forces. As I stated before, houses are meant to be lived in. And if you're refusing to invite God into your home, you may invite something else instead. There are no other alternatives. Sorry. That's just the universe we live in. You're either indwelt by the Holy Spirit or you will potentially one day outside of your control become indwelt by demons. A lot of people in our world today that exhibit what the world would call psychological disorders are likely, in fact, suffering from demonization. I'm not saying every single person exhibiting some kind of psychosis is demon-possessed. I also believe in a fallen world, and people suffer from what's called natural sin that causes some people to have damaged brains. I understand that perfectly well. What I'm saying is that as a Christian, I understand within the range of possibilities to explain what looks like psychosis, demon possession exists. The materialist secularist will not even consider that possibility. Now, it hardly needs to be said, but I'll say it just for completion's sake. For the believer, one of the ways to describe your new identity in Christ is a holy temple that houses the Holy Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. You're not an empty home. You cannot be possessed. It's one of the many great benefits of being safe in the arms of Jesus. You're not only safe from God's wrath, you're not only safe from hell, you are safe from demons. How demons interact with the Christian is not outright possession, Rather, in the words of John MacArthur, it's through the continuous battle of resisting the devil's temptations that he dangles in front of your sight. And further, before we give the devil too much credit, we are more than capable of tempting ourselves due to our fleshly nature, okay? So don't get so obsessed about the demonic activity in your life if you're a believer. But for the non-believers listening to me, I don't know what else to tell you. You should be very concerned about demonic activity surrounding your life. As an empty house, you are constantly facing the potential danger of being controlled by unnatural spiritual forces. And we are not given great detail on how or why this indwelling of demons happens. We do know in vague detail that there is an element of participatory invitation by the recipient of demons. For instance, in Luke chapter 22, verse 3, the word of God states, quote, Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot. Uh, compelling him to betray the Lord Jesus and deliver him over to be murdered. However, it should be noted that Judas was not being utterly controlled against his will. Judas was a traitor from the beginning. Other sections of the Gospels tell us that he would be regularly stealing from the collective purse of the disciples, for example, because he was a thief. Judas already had in his heart a hatred for Jesus. And what demonic possession did to him is really enhanced a trajectory of rebellion and sin he was already on. So as vulnerable, empty homes, 
The natural unbelieving man commits the highest kind of foolishness when dabbling with the occult and actively seeking ways to enter an alternative state of mind, an alternative spiritual existence, and turn himself into an open vessel inviting spiritual forces into his soul that he definitionally, as an earthbound creature, cannot know anything about. Yet, this is exactly what ufologists like Stephen Greer encourage his adherents to do following his so-called close encounters of the fifth kind or CE5 protocol. The CE5 protocol, which sounds very scientific, right? And by the way, this is a preview of an idea we're going to be discussing in a future episode. But the deception of ufology as a whole is how it gives the superficial appearance of materialist rationality that appeals to the modern Enlightenment era skeptic committed to anti-supernaturalism. But then when you step far enough into the world of UFOs, where you end up is always just good old fashioned paganism. And CE5 is no different. Followers of the CE5 method call their founder Dr. Greer. He's supposed to be a very scientific, rational man. He uses all sorts of very impressive, intelligent-sounding terminologies. It's not UFOs. That's silly. Never mind the fact that the term UFO was originally supposed to be the scientific term for flying saucers. They're UAPs now. They're interdimensional beings. They're transmedia crafts. Yet, when you dig into the CE5 method, you realize this is nothing more than pagan occult meditation. Stephen Greer is nothing more than a religious cult leader. These silly UFO enthusiasts that like to call themselves ufologists, that like to claim I'm just following the scientific evidence wherever it leads. When you see the practices of things like CE5, the hilarious revelation is that these guys are nothing more than Satan worshipers. They're no different from the ancient Mayans or Aztecs or Baal worshipers, ancient people that the typical ufologists like Luis Elizondo would love to disparage and look down on as beneath them as a bunch of unsophisticated primitives. Yet CE5 practitioners are literally no different. According to Stephen Greer, CE5 begins by choosing a quiet and remote location and then putting on a positive and open mindset, speaking out your heart's intention into the universe that you want to make peaceful contact with extraterrestrial beings. You evoke deep relaxation techniques, quiet your mind, focus your consciousness. You can put on some meditation recording, some ambient music to put you in the mood, visualize a sphere of light surrounding you with love and positive vibes. Do you guys not hear yourselves? Do you not realize how ridiculous you sound? But here's a dirty secret about CE5 that nobody in the community really tells you until you're already too far deep into it. You ready for this? Here's a secret. When you run around in a forest at night, centering your consciousness or whatever nonsense, and open your mind to these beings, inviting them into your spirit, and then you finally make contact with that supernatural orb of light, or you witness little beings emerging from the woods and the shadows, you know what nobody tells you ahead of time when that occurs? Those beings will often follow you back home. But don't take it from me. I want absolutely nothing to do with demons. Like I said last episode, I'm doing as little research as I need to do to be well prepared for this series. My ambition is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and consciously meditate, which by the way, does not mean emptying your mind. It means filling your mind, thinking about something. My ambition is to meditate on God's word. I want you to hear from the practitioners of CE5 themselves. This is firsthand testimony from John Sistrunk on the CE5 podcast published April 23rd, 2023. For a lot of people, they'll try to do something, uh, you know, either a little more distant or maybe um, there are multiple ways to interact with me. You know how you can feel someone's presence, even if you didn't consciously know they were there, you can kind of feel the field itself, especially if they really move close. I've had that happen a couple of times where they've really moved close and almost immediately, like within a few minutes, a military helicopter flies over the house. People do something like move something. 
Um, I had one knock up a cooking pan across the room one time. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'll feel them touch me uh, on rare occasions. If I'm meditating, they'll suddenly come and start playing with my hair. And, you know, there's nothing in there. There's no air currents, no bugs. If you don't find that disturbing enough, here's another one with Linda Lobeck, published August 23rd, 2021. And they can show up also at home. Like when I do C5 at home, you know, I have them here interdimensionally and I see orbs. It's funny. Yeah, they can they can show up um, indoors and in, in your house and stuff. And this is something that I think a lot of people aren't expecting when they first come into this or they're thinking, oh, yeah, we're going to go on a sky watch. Right. Or we're going to look at oh. see UFOs. Um, yeah. But that, there's a whole other aspect to, to contact, isn't there, where they can um, show up. And, and if you you can train your vision and um, some people, I mean, they'll like hear them more or, you know, like everybody's different in how they might experience or how the ETs might interact. Things moving by themselves in your home, invisible beings communicating with you inside your head, hearing strange tones, seeing strange lights, people trying to access the spiritual world through techniques the Bible explicitly condemns are flirting with danger. Demonic forces are not just trying to put on a fun little light show for you in the night sky. Make no mistake, the object of Satan's desire isn't just your fascination, it's you. We have two more characteristics to go through next episode to complete our inductive study of individual supernatural UFO sightings I've added to since last episode for a total of seven. And they are characteristic six, inexplicable UFOs fly through the sky, actually quite relevant to the biblical description of demons. And finally, characteristic seven, they appear to be ancient. But that's all the time we have for today. Please visit moderndogma.com for all our links. And please consider leaving us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Men air, God is sovereign.